part two now of talking about markets. We're going to talk about markets working, and then we're going to talk about markets not working, what we call market failure. If we look at Adam Smith and that work of Adam Smith and his buddies, he grabs a hold of this word natural and uses it in the context to mean what we would say is equilibrium. In Adam Smith's world, there's a natural price. There's a place where the market gets to on its own if it's left alone. A place where the market gets to on its own if it's left alone. We call that point equilibrium. Adam Smith would call it natural. It's a place, a price, that balances the market for both the buyers and the sellers. So again, we use this phrase equilibrium, word equilibrium, to mean a point where, a price where, and a quantity where both the consumers and the businesses are satisfied. Consumers get to buy the quantity that they want to buy. Businesses get to sell the quantity that they want to sell. Equilibrium, balance in the marketplace. So, Adam Smith, equilibrium is natural. It's where the market goes on its own. And if this is all true, markets are inherently stable. Markets find that equilibrium on their own, without help, balance themselves. They're stable. If we get kicked away, if the price gets pushed up, above or down below equilibrium, the natural processes of the market bring it back to equilibrium. It's stable. Now, there's a problem with that, which is that all those assumptions that there's lots of buyers and sellers, that there's good information, that people have all the free choice they need, businesses and consumers, those assumptions have to hold if this is going to work. So let's do a couple of thought experiments here about what happens in markets. So let's think about we have a market at equilibrium and then workers' wages go up. Workers' wages are a cost of production. Everybody would think that the price will go up because a cost of production goes up. In addition to that, though, we have this balance between supply and demand, between margin utility and marginal cost. Workers' wages go up, profits are going to go down, businesses are less interested in supplying the product, so besides seeing the price of this product go up, we're going to see less being produced and less being sold. The quantity, the equilibrium quantity, is going to go down. Now, what happens if Southwest Airlines raises their fares and we're United Airlines? We're United, they're Southwest, we are what economists call substitutes. If I'm United and I see Southwest raising their fares $20 on a route that we fly, Consumers, we know, prefer low prices. So consumers who were flying Southwest are all of a sudden going to look to fly United. I would expect the quantity of what I sell to rise. But, but again, balance in the market. I, as United, also know that I can raise my fares. If Southwest went up by 20 I could go up by 5 or 10, still steal a bunch of their business, and be better off on two regards. I'm selling more tickets at a higher price. What happens to bread if people decide to go gluten-free? Hmm. Well, we're going to buy less bread. The quantity of bread being demanded by consumers will go down. We're going to sell less bread. How will businesses respond to this? 
Well, they want to try to keep us buying bread. And how do they do that? They lower the price. So a drive to go gluten-free should not only lower the quantity of bread that we sell, but it should also lower the price for people who are still eating bread. Now, we just had a big tax cut on businesses. What should happen if the assumptions hold if we cut taxes on business? Well, now businesses' profits increase. They want to sell more of their product. How do they encourage consumers to buy more? They would lower the price and raise the quantity. So we should see from that tax cut, lower prices, increased quantities sold. We should see something that benefits both the business and consumers. That's not always what we see. And in the case of this tax cut, because the tax cut went to markets where maybe there isn't really competition, what we saw was some of this tax cut going to stock purchases where the businesses took their tax cut and they used it to buy their own stock back. Well, that's not in this simple world. That idea doesn't exist in this simple world where we have lots of buyers and lots of them. They spent, took a trillion dollars of this tax cut and bought their own stock with it. If the assumptions don't hold, then maybe the market doesn't function the way we think it should. So remember that markets are about margin utility and marginal cost and about maximizing behavior. They're assuming that we all maximize. And again, there's a lot of evidence that we don't quite act this way. And before the semester's over, we'll talk about some of that and, and what it means. All right, so people operating in a free market do not always make the best choices. Sometimes they draft players that uh, turn out not being able to play. We want to talk about market failure and how market failure works in the real world. The first example, and we've already just barely touched on this, but what happens if there's a lack of competition? Microsoft sells 90% of all the operating system software and 95% of all the word processing software on the planet Earth. That would mean that the prices they can charge would be unusually high because there's lots of buyers and not many choices. As we get more choices, whether it's uh, Google Docs or some other choice word perfect, as we get more choices... Microsoft's power over the market is diminished, but clearly in the world where there's a lack of competition, they can charge us very high prices for something because we have no choice. The other side to that would be I'm a music company, I'm Spotify, I'm a record company, and I want to put Taylor Swift's music out there because for some reason, people, some people want to listen to it. Well, Taylor Swift is the best-selling artist on the planet Earth. She's going to be able to set terms to these music companies. They have to have her. Spotify has to have her in their model. iTunes has to have her stuff. Amazon has to have her stuff. Because they have to have it, she can define a lot of the terms of how it's provided. There are some things, and we'll talk about this, this is really our next topic after we talk about markets here, some things that we call public goods. There are some things that, turns out, are provided best by a government, by a central authority. Imagine that you had to pay to go to court, and you had to pay the judge, and you're suing some really rich guy. Who do you think is going to win the lawsuit? You or the rich guy? So that may happen anyhow, but there's these things called public goods that only function effectively, we think, if the government manages them, and we'll talk about that. Who owns the trees? If you 
are running around England 1,500 years ago, and you live in a little village, and there's a forest all around you. Who owns those trees? If you're a fisher person, and you're fishing in a lake by your house, or fishing in the ocean off Alaska, who owns the fish? Well, there's some things that we call common property resources, and we'll talk about this more. But if nobody specifically owns something, but kind of everybody does, we're going to use too much of it. We're going to cut down too many trees and make the forest go away. We're going to fish too many fishes and make the fish go away. And the only way we can protect common property resources are through some kind of collective action, some kind of joint action. Externalities. Sometimes when one person or two people make a choice or an exchange, they can pass some of that cost onto someone else, or they can create a benefit for someone else. When that happens, that's called an externality. You drive down the road, you create pollution, somebody else has to deal with the effects of that pollution. You're at a club and somebody lights up, starts smoking around you, you're paying a cost for their smoking. The school district builds an elementary school right down the street from your house. That's going to increase the value of your house. The school district builds a high school down the street from your house. That's going to decrease the value of your house. So we're constantly in this world where other people are doing things that create costs or benefits for us. And that means that the people who are doing that transaction are not pricing it correctly because they don't have to deal with some of the costs or some of the benefits. And it means we all are connected in ways that the simple market model doesn't say that we are. And sometimes we need to get involved in that, we think, in kind of a collective action. We'll talk about that. What happens if we don't have perfect information? And used cars are the perfect example of this. In fact, economists uh, have actually won Nobel Prizes for work that started out studying used car markets. What happens when the seller knows a lot more about the thing that we're buying than the buyer is? That means the buyer is going to be wary. Persons who buy used cars are wary of them. They're scared of them. That means they're going to tend to undervalue them and want to pay less than what they're worth for a good used car and are probably going to pay more than what they're worth for a really bad used car. So the market's not going to work right if our information is wrong. Now a subset of that asymmetric information is what's called moral hazard. Moral hazard means you're going to enter in a contract with somebody and they're hiding something for, from you. There's a moral hazard in contracting with someone. If you're a life insurance company and you're about to offer life insurance to someone, wouldn't you like to know that they're about to take up skydiving before you offer them the policy? If someone is about to get a health insurance policy, that person is likely to not let their insurer know that they have a pre-existing condition if they can because the insurance company is going to try not to cover a problem that they already know that they have. I rent cars sometimes and when I'm driving that car back to the car lot at McCarran, if you've ever been to the car rental return at McCarran, there's these little speed bumps on the way in. I don't slow down for them. If it was my car, I would slow down for those speed bumps, but it's their car. I don't really care. So I have a tendency not to slow down for the speed bumps. That's a moral hazard problem. We also have government rules and regulations, and those are both about market failure. A lot of government rules and regulations exist because of market failure, because of externalities, because of asymmetric information. We have externalities created by pollution, so we have rules and regulations to try to stop pollution. We have consumers not really able to know 
anything about how their food gets to the grocery store, and so we have government inspections of food to make sure the food that gets to your grocery store is safe and the labels are right. Uh, we have issues about net neutrality and is problems that can occur economically because of or that don't occur that we change the market because of a rule or regulation. So all of these government rules and regulations, many of them are tied up in these issues of asymmetric information and externalities, either stopping them or potentially trying to resolve an issue that was created by one. There's a lot more stuff about this, and we'll get to various things over time, but this should give you an idea about why markets work, how they work, and why sometimes they don't work.